Hello and welcome back. It has been a very heady experience listening to all these inputs about the logics and logistics of the linkages between openness and education. As you must have figured out by now, there isn't really a clear consensus about what it means to be open and how we achieve a state of being open. However, this lack of consensus is not a question of whether openness is good or bad, but it is more about the fact that openness is a layered concept and that it's not going to be easy to be selectively open. I'm going to try and talk today of openness as a wicked problem, something that changes when it is named, transforms when it is approached and produces internal paradoxes that makes it difficult to build roadmaps towards building open societies and structures. So how do we understand openness as a wicked problem? By looking at the various trajectories of being open, which coexist, but do not necessarily always talk to each other. I'm going to propose for us that openness is a suite of disconnected practices that are synchronous, but not syncretic. Let's ground this in the concrete example of education and learning. In open education, open refers to a political commitment of making education available freely and openly to all who seek it. It resonates both with the Millennium Development Goal as well as the United Nations Child and Human Rights Guidelines, which posits education as one of the fundamental and foundational rights towards building just, fair and equal societies. Openness is seen not only as an operation, but as a vision of a world that is restructured through principles of sharing, caring and connecting. The vision of open education often resides on the operational logics of open access, open courseware and open learning, which means that we try and transform our knowledge production industries to treat knowledge as a common resource that's freely available rather than a finite commodity that's artificially produced in scarcity and hence made selectively available at a price. The open access movement has questioned intellectual property rights regimes, advocated for alternative public licensing, and created copyleft and creative commons spaces which encourage knowledge producers and institutions to open up knowledge for easy digital access. Open courseware proponents have rightfully pointed out that learning does not happen only through access to material, but through engagement and interaction with others who have different and sometimes more specialized experiences in the domain. Thus, um, open courseware, for instance, shifts the focus from information transfer to engaged learning and encourages teaching individuals and universities to open up their classrooms through hybrid forms of pedagogy. Similarly, open learning movements have concentrated on what I call the novice-expert duality of learning. It insists that the traditional structure of uh, the one-to-many teaching, where the instructor is the authoritative expert and the student is, student is a recipient of knowledge, is flawed. Open learning models propose many-to-many, peer-to-peer connected learning, where the experiences and past knowledges of the students inform and become central to teaching and pedagogy. Instead of uh, teaching, the emphasis is on creating core learning spaces and practices that enable the student to situate their knowledge in the diverse contexts that they embody. So far, so good. These are all interventions about opening up pedagogy and content to more inclusive, distributed and accessible educational resources. Institutional and government focus on promoting the principles of open education have found various degrees of success. Um, let's imagine a space where all of these principles have been actualized, where all knowledge is free and openly accessible. Expert teaching is transmitted to massive communities of learners and peer-to-peer -peer interaction shapes the core of the educational structure. It is the ideal state scenario where the poorest, more underprivileged student in the far-flung corners of the world, if she desires, can have access to these learning resources. But how would this be operationalized? If all the devices that are needed to access these resources are expensive proprietary products which are so prohibitively expensive that they are not available to the imagined underprivileged learner, then all of our efforts at open education are already flawed. 
Projects like One Laptop Per Child have indeed tried to address these questions and call for making affordable devices available to mass markets. However, the real life scenario is more likely that these learners use cheap, reverse engineered, open hardware phones that allow for pervasive digital access to be a possibility. Even if the devices were available, what would be the operating system that the students would use? If the course materials available only in proprietary formats that require expensive softwares and applications to access them, what happens next? These are questions that are being addressed by open source movements that are emphasizing that all public, governmental and educational processes need to be operationalized by open hardware and open source principles. Implementing open education on proprietary technology platforms is counterproductive and not only thwarts the ambitions of the open education practice, but also in invalidates the cost and effects uh, that are involved in this opening of education. Thus, open education has to find intersections with open technology movements. And it is a conversation that's still nascent, if not almost entirely missing. Now, add to this intersection another spoke. Let's say that the open processes of education have been established using open technology standards and protocols. Who gets to access this connected learning environment? The mythical student on the fringes does not have infrastructure of access. Even in countries like India and China, where the mobile revolutions are connecting new communities to the internet, access to web resources is expensive. Infrastructure for electricity, networks and connectivity cannot be taken for granted. In such situations, private internet companies and internet service providers like Google and Facebook become the champions of providing infrastructure. For instance, Facebook's non-profit foundation internet.org is rolling out free access through regional telecommunications operators for those who cannot afford internet access. However, when they do provide this free internet access, they also collect and track data about usage, habits, likes, dislikes, needs, demography, location and identity of the users. The access to common resources is not necessarily free. It is exchanged with data, which is the new currency of our quantified societies. What happens to this data? Who it is sold to? How it is used to influence behavior ranging from consumption to political voting remains opaque. So the most vulnerable are made more vulnerable as they are granted access to resources which are supposed to empower them. These are questions of open governance where activists are demanding structures of transparency, accountability and responsibility from those who broker and mediate our data. In order to create a safe learning environment that grants open access through open technologies, we will need a complementary structure of open governance and regulation. And if this is not complicated enough, there is a set of problems that still remains unanswered. If the role of the digital is to convert memory into storage so that what is known is archived and only that which is remembered uh, and, and that is remembered which has been archived, what happens to all our data when it gets stored in different non-forgetting archives? One of the privileges of learning environments is your capacity to make mistakes to explore dubious territories of thought and argumentation, of playing the devil's advocate sometimes in attempts to learn about different perspectives. Classrooms are like Vegas. What happens there often has to stay there. But in connected open learning environments, everything that you do know, everything that you do is known. Everything that is known is stored. And everything that is stored is open for permanent remembrance. There is no disowning of that history. The trail of cookies points right at you. And in the future, which we cannot even imagine, these trails are going to hold the learner accountable, responsible, and culpable for things that they might have said within a different context. Does the learner have the right to be forgotten? Do they have the privilege of remaining anonymous? How shall we build systems of openness that allow for opting out giving learners control of not only what to learn and how to learn, but also what can be known and remembered of what they learned and how they did it. 
New dialogues will then have to be forged with activism and intervention around open data that remind us that data storage is not benign and open data comes with pitfalls and dangers that are often underplayed or not made visible in the open up everything debates. My proposition then is simple, even as it addresses a complex problem. In order to think about open education, we will need to dislocate our attention from the narrow scope of the classroom and start looking at an entire complex of learning and knowledge production that's created by processes of governance, regulation, licensing, ownership, um, sharing, infrastructure, code, control and consumption. Openness, when addressed in a silo, produces some inroads into our ambition of building open societies but they become roads to nowhere if they are not accompanied by a simultaneous opening up of the contemporary, complementary and inextricable structures that form the invisible infrastructure of education and learning. Increasingly, as we live with big data, become quantified selves, are rendered into profiles, avatars and identities by self-learning, iterative, unforgetting algorithms, we need to recognize that open learning is not just about opening up learning resources to us, but that implicit in it is how we are opened up for these technologies to learn and understand us. Looking at these relationships of being open to avail of openness is the prompt for us to start thinking of openness as a multi-tier, multi-layered, wicked problem. And like most wicked problems, it will necessitate new strategies and tactics for resolution. We are going to need not only a connected politics of openness where different stakeholders unite in their visions and practices of the open, examining the intersection differences and synergies of our open visions, but we are also going to need a strategy of simultaneously zooming in and out. On the one hand, we need to focus more microscopically on open, teasing out the molecular configurations and exchanges involved, and on the other, we are also going to train ourselves to look at openness sideways, to zoom out and be able to explore things that might not be immediately visible in the relationship with openness, but are definitely present on the family tree of the open. Thank you.